All right, good morning. We're going to go ahead and begin our Sunday school hour. Good to have folks out here today on this last Sunday in February. Can you believe March is just a few days away? Wow. Just before we begin in prayer and then open up the floor for testimonies, just a reminder, if you've not picked up one or more of the little uh, year theme. We have plenty of those, one per person. You could take several per people. You want a couple different ones. We'll put one at work to remind you, one on the fridge, one in your Bible, one in the workshop, whatever, one in the vehicle. Uh, put them all around. And again, you can, you can have 50 copies of these. <laughs> you can look at them every morning. But the question is, did you live the scriptures last week? Could you, if we went around a little groups right now this morning, said, how did you live the scriptures this past week? As you've been reading through the Bible now and you're doing your basic devotions, what did you live out? If you're silent on that one, then you're going to be careful because then you're not living it. Uh, as you read the Bible, it's, it, there should be all kind of new things that we see. It should change our thinking. It should change our habits. It should change our actions. It should change our attitudes. So if we're just reading and reading and reading, we say, I don't, uh, let's see, when's the last time I lived it out, really lived it out by faith, or even changed something that I thought was right, but the scriptures confronted that, I was wrong, I changed, I'm changing that now. Search the scriptures, live the scriptures, I pray, pray that we are doing that. We'll see it, I mean, it'll be evident in our church family. It'll be evident, it'll be evident in our homes, it'll be evident among our teens, and our adults, we will see attitudes changing, thinking changing, our spirit changing, all right, faith, I mean, it'll, it'll happen, all right, if not, we can grow very cold, very cynical, very proud, very quickly, so uh, may I be the example in that, but I pray, pray all of us are searching, reading, studying, as well as living out the scripture, that, all right, let's begin in prayer, thank you, Lord, for this morning, thank you for your word, I pray that we would be those who search and read and study and memorize the scriptures, but Lord, if we stop right there, uh, Lord, uh, we won't really change very much. Lord, we'll become proud in the fact that we know the Bible. We can quote the Bible. We know the stories of the Bible. Uh, Lord, we have Bible knowledge, but Lord, if we don't live it, if it practically is not making a change in our lives, if our heart is still cold, if our attitude is still sour, uh, Lord, if we're critical and look down on others, Lord, if we don't have a servant's heart, if we have no burden for the lost and don't share it, then Lord, it's worthless. Lord, we'll be, we'll be fooled. We'll be deceived, as James says. We'll think we're something when we're not. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be believers who live out the Bible on a daily basis. And Lord, that the scriptures is a vital part of our home, our marriage, our family. Lord, we would hold it dearly and we would allow it to transform us by our thinking, renewing of our mind. And Lord, I pray that IBC and those who attend here regularly Lord, we be known as people of the book who love the Word of God. We read it, we study it, we live it. And Lord, may our thinking and attitudes and actions be changed on a daily basis. Lord, we thank you for the power of prayer. We thank you for the ministry of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for many who have recently uh, had surgeries or had appointments or had different things, Lord, that we praise the Lord for good reports. We praise the Lord for good recoveries thus far. We pray for continued recovery. We pray for those that may not be under the weather, maybe sick we're not aware of at home today, perhaps watching, tuning in from home. Lord, encourage them in the Lord. I pray may we be a blessing to them by uh, way of a, a phone call, a visit, a card, a meal, a Lord, a gift of money, perhaps if you laid it on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to meet together. May you bless this Sunday school hour, our classes, our morning service, Lord, all that goes on, our, our dinner, Lord, our fellowship together. May it be sweet. May it be encouraging, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let them slip on out. You know, some of you, again, if you have children and your children are not familiar with Lent and all this stuff, you're like, what is all that? Teach them, tell them about it a little bit. Even if uh, you might have to do some talking to folks, all right? Uh, you may not have grown up that way or in that area, but certainly prevalent around here, you see with all the menus and restaurants and ads and different people. And give them some answers for that, all right? And no doubt they have friends and folks at school and different places they work that probably hold to that and do those kind of things. I was reminded of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. All right? Uh, there again, contextually, it's talking about some different things that were going on back there, but uh, that's been something that uh, still a big thing today. You think of those who, you know, Asheville was a big area with... Uh, Vegan, that's a big vegan area and a uh, big pita area. <laughs> and uh, they try to make you feel guilty for, like, you go to the restaurant to get a steak. And people, oh, you know, you're not supposed to eat that stuff. All right. Bible says, all right, 
commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received. Now, for health reasons, you choose not to. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. All right? It's not a, not a law, though, in the scriptures there. And we see that even with uh, the Jewish diet, right? And the book of uh, Acts there where Peter and the Lord said, eat. And he said, I've never eaten any of those unclean animals. Eat. The Lord's no longer under that. So uh, use the scriptures, know the scriptures, be able to uh, converse and give answers from the Bible. And I hope you do that on a regular basis. Luke 24, we started here last week, Luke 24, 27. We'll just start off here, and then we're going to get right to that parable. And Luke, we'll go back just a few chapters to Luke 13, all right? So uh, Luke 24, we're, we're here looking in, in Sunday school on, again, we're sort of just been taking the search the Scriptures, live the Scriptures properly, interpreting the Scriptures Again, what if you read the Bible constantly? You love reading the Bible and you enjoy it. And you read a lot, but you don't interpret the verse properly, all right? Or you don't understand it properly, and so therefore that forms a thought, a view, a philosophy, a standard, which is incorrect or could be incorrect, then that does great harm. And so we do need to be careful, obviously, on what the Bible says. So we're looking at the word hermeneutics. More coming from a Latin background, Greek background. Usually when you see the word interpretation in the Bible, that's the word hermeneutics, all right? Uh, you'll see that a lot in the book of uh, Matthew, uh, which is by interpretation. Sometimes it'll give interpretation of someone's name, all right? Uh, even where Daniel interpreted dreams, Joseph in the Old Testament. It's the same idea there. They're giving the interpretation. This is what the dream means. This is what this is, all right? And here in Luke chapter 24, we looked at this sort of as a key verse. Speaking of Jesus, uh, after the resurrection with these two on the road to Emmaus, verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, that's taking the Old Testament, he, Jesus, expounded unto them. That's the word there, expounded. <clears throat> that's the word to explain, to unfold the meaning, to interpret. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. So they, they knew the scriptures, they had intellectual knowledge of the scriptures. They probably could quote the scriptures, but Christ took the scriptures that they knew and expounded to them, all right? Gave the interpretation of it to where they did not see that that was speaking about him because they were discussing who Jesus was, the Messiah. We thought that he was the one, but he died. <laughs> we, we had to put our hope in him. There's been rumors that he's living, but we're not sure. And so he takes them back to the scriptures and shows them how that pointed to him and what they should have believed. He expounded unto them. And literally that's what preaching is. Preaching is taking the scriptures and, and properly expounding them through preaching, making sure we're expounding it biblically, all right? Christ took the scriptures, showed them through proper interpretation how those truths pertain. Again, that's something that the Holy Spirit does for believers, Holy Spirit's that teacher, that guide. He will guide us into all truth. He's the illuminator. That's why we should be reading the Bible in the case. Oh, that's what that means. Now this makes sense. Now I see as I put these pieces together as I'm reading. I'm reading the Old Testament. Now I'm reading in John. And I, oh, I can't believe I didn't see that before. Bing, wow, that's, that's illumination, spiritual illumination. That's open mine eyes, Lord, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy Law. So hermeneutics, by way of review, is to discover the meaning of the text in its proper setting, to draw meaning from Scripture. All right? So we're looking at, we're looking here at the parable, you're going to flip backwards a little bit, to Luke 13, Luke 13. So I, I've given you this as a little bit of an example, a very small little parable that we want to look at, not one that's commonly read, taught, or mentioned, all right? So we're in Luke 13, and we're going to go to verse number 20. All right, so Luke 13, verse number 20. And again, he said, now that just means that, we're going to go back and read 18 and 19 in a minute. That means he shares a similar parable with a similar view and interpretation. So when it says, verse 20, and again, he said, whereunto, this is Jesus, whereunto, or how shall I liken the kingdom of God? Right? People are always asking, tell us about the kingdom. When's the kingdom? Is the kingdom here? What's the kingdom of God? What's it going to be? So he gives a second parable. The first one's in 18, 19. Verse 21. He gives a very small, it's one sentence. It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. 
Now that's it, because the next verse says he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. So he gives a short little parable. Now, just before we get in that a little bit, let's look at the previous parable. Verse 18. Then said he, unto what is the kingdom of God like? And whereunto shall I resemble it? So it's similar parables with a similar viewpoint, answering the similar question about the kingdom of God and what it's going to be like. In verse 19, he says, it is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And then again and again he said. So we have two little parables here. They are tied together. Now here's the thing. There's no interpretation given. So Christ does not explain them here in any way. All right? So then, oh, now do we just avoid it and say, well, I don't know. how could anybody know? All right? Do we just say, well, I think, I, 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 I'm just going to assume, I think it means this, so that's what it's going to mean. And so I'm going to just go with that, all right? Or do we say, okay, now, is this a mystery? Is this impossible to know? Uh, can this be known? Now, we'll say this. I don't believe anybody can dogmatically say, this is what it means, and you're wrong, because how could you? There is no interpretation given the scripture. Now, I can say what I'm about to say. This is what I believe it means, and I strongly believe it means this, and I'm confident it means this. But I could not say this is absolutely what it means, and anybody else is wrong, all right? Uh, but there are a lot of different things. For instance, last night, I was looking at, uh, I did what a lot of people do. Uh, I, what, if, what if someone read this and said, boy, I don't know what this means. Yes, I could open up some books and commentaries. Many people don't, don't have those or use those anymore. They go to their phone. There's commentaries on their phone and different things. I said, what if someone just said, hmm, I read this verse. I came across it as I was reading through Luke. Or it was a, it was a little verse mentioned in a devotional. I don't really know what it means. I, I should know what it means. And so I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to try to figure out what it means. And so you just punch in on your phone or computer. All right. Um, what does Luke 20 or 13, 20, 21 mean? or Bible commentary on Luke 13, 20, 21. And then, bing, all right? And now I can I have hundreds of sources I could go to, uh, Christianity.com, Bible Hub, got this, boom, 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 whatever. Boy, I can look at all these different ones, all right? Now, do you, uh, you may not have any background on the website, you may not know who writes it, who the sources are, uh, if it's associated with anything, uh, who's the commentator, what does he hold to, what does she hold to, uh, what is their beliefs. Oh, I mean, but there it is. I'm just going to look at it. And t typically the ones that pop up are the, probably the ones that are more well-known or the ones that are get the most sources or they're the ones you use. And so because of all of that, the computer knows that. And so you read these and you read about three different ones to show you, hmm, and they may all agree, they may disagree. <laughs> and so I, uh, I took some snapshots here. I don't like to use my phone a whole lot here, but I, I was reading a couple different ones. So, all right, here is one. I won't, I won't tell you what it was under, what the main thing was. So this one says, the second pair of the mustard seed here and the leaven. This represents, both of these parables represent the dynamic growth of the church from small beginnings, even while adversaries confront it. The leaven represents the progress of the church against and despite the contagious outspread of sin. Now, there's one. You say, hey, this is just talking about no matter what comes, and, the, and sort of taking the, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so even though the gospel and the church is little, it's going to continue to flourish and spread despite all of the enemies against it. Okay, okay. I can't say that maybe that, that's just what one person says, all right? So we come to another one here, and here is, here is their view on how to interpret uh, this is a study guide commentary, which means that you are responsible for your own interpretation of the Bible. Each of us must walk in the light we have. You, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit are priority in interpretation. You must not relinquish this to a commentator. Now, some of that you may agree with. Hopefully some of that you did not. All right. Here's another one. There's a third one. You look it up. Leaven uh, was often a symbol of evil. But here, in this, it is an obvious symbol of the pervasiveness and growth of the kingdom of God. Be careful of attaching one definition or connotation to a word, regardless of its context. Context determines meaning, all right? Now, some of those things, 
I have mentioned, but some of those things I would say is poor hermeneutics and will easily lead someone astray. And so if that's how you primarily get what the Bible means, you're in danger. <laughs> how do you know? Uh, what, if that's a, what if that's Catholic? What if that's Mormon? Or what if that's a different one? What if it's Seventh-day Adventism? Uh, what if the person believes in communism? What if, I mean, all of that's going to pervade their commentary, so you have to be very, very careful. And some of what I just read there is out and out wrong. Now, you may not have picked up on it. You might be sluggish. You may be daydreaming. You may be thinking of other things. You may, it may be hard to, I understand that. But some of what they said is good, but other times they said, you know, that one said, now, leaven is, is usually used bad, but now here it's not. Well, how do you know that? Why do you say that? So is the scripture going to co contradict itself? So if it's, all, if it's going to mean this in some things and this in some things, so how do we know? And so you've got to be careful. And so this is an interesting one, and this is why I chose this one, all right? And again, so we have a little parable here. You say, well, how, how do we know? How do we know? I mean, is the leaven good or is the leaven bad? Because that would then affect the entire thing, okay? So we said, well, we want to use hermeneutics, and that's properly interpreting the scriptures. We want to interpret it literally. It means a literal sense. Don't, don't allegorize it. Many, many people interpret the scriptures, and many uh, teachers use allegorical or devotional. They say, well, everything has a secondary meaning, or you just take it, and you just develop it, and, and look at it as allegories. No, take it literally. Take it actually literally in all points, all right, unless there are grammatical things. Take it historically. In its historical context, and take it actually gram grammatically. This is what it means grammatically. Now, there are some exceptions, and we're going to look at that. All right? So we say, well, how do we know about the leaven? So let's, let's examine leaven a little bit. It, you just, if you've been reading through the Bible, you've been reading, as, as Barbara mentioned, Genesis, Ex, Leviticus, you're finishing up numbers if you're uh, keeping close to what the schedule is for what the church uses. If you did, you saw leaven, you should have seen leaven a bunch there in Leviticus and a lot of the different things you bring in. And uh, it's almost always used in a negative context. One time, I think, if you go back through there, it is used positively with a certain offering. Other than that, though, 95% of the times, it is usually associated with evil and sin, uh, unleavened bread, the unleavened bread, the Passover, no leaven in any way in it, don't have any of the leaven in it there. And then you come to the New Testament, and we want to use Scripture with Scripture. So I would think the key to interpreting this is study leaven a little bit in the Bible. All right? And so we go backwards a chapter to Luke chapter 12. Everybody just flip back here, Luke chapter 12. Before we begin to assume this means this, before we assume what someone said or read, we want to make sure, hmm, let's see, does this really mean this? Is it possible to know? Luke 12, 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode one upon another, massive crowds, he, Jesus, began to say unto the disciples, first of all, no, why, why does he say this? Because of the large crowds. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hmm. Okay. You say, well, okay. Well, obviously right there, he's, he's warning them about, and he says, the leaven of the Pharisees. That's interesting. All right. So we, we see that there a little bit there. Let's go back to Matthew. Flip backwards to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Before we want to assume or even ask any questions yet, we want to study a little bit of what the Bible says about leaven. All right. So we come here now to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Verse, let's start at verse 5. Matthew 16, 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, so they, they crossed the uh, Sea of Galilee Lake, they had forgotten to take bread. Oops, we're hungry, we don't have any food, we don't have any bread. Verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Another, he's warning, beware. Now notice... <laughs> they're like you and I, verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we've taken no bread. Uh-oh. The Lord's chastening us, chastening us because we forgot to bring bread. We forgot the food. <laughs> That's not what the Lord... Notice how they interpreted that. <laughs> the Lord, he said something about leaven. All we heard was leaven. <laughs> so we took what we heard and we misinterpreted it. He's sort of like chastening. Come on, guys. How come you didn't bring bread? Whoops, that's not what the Lord meant. And the Lord interprets it in verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, 
This is mean they're thinking this or they're whispering it. It's not out loud. Which when Jesus perceived, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not, not understand? There, hey, there it is again. Do ye not understand? You're not properly understanding what I'm teaching and saying. Now, if the disciples can do that, can you and I not do that? Is it not possible to hear uh, the paragraph the preacher preaches, but you only got one sentence? You, only, you were distracted. You were daydreaming. You were sleeping. You didn't really, you only heard one thing. And so you, you formed something from that. Or you read the verse, but you're, uh, notice, oh, we heard leaven. The Lord's not happy that we didn't bring bread. Now, the Lord didn't do this, but I would have. <laughs> we don't have a bread problem. Were you not with me when I fed the 5,000? <laughs> I don't need bread. I can, that's what he's saying. Do you not understand? What do you mean, verse 9? Don't you remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand. Twice you have seen miraculous miracles where I have fed massive crowds without any food or limited food, and I don't even need food. I'm not chastening you because we didn't bring bread and we're hungry. He, he, he gives the interpretation. Verse, what? 11. How is it that you don't understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not be aware of the leaven of bread. He's not saying, oh, uh, you know, the little bit of yeast in the bread is evil. You should have brought bread. Uh, uh, oh, 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 verse 12. But of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. But of the doctrine. So notice right there, he, Christ uses leaven on a couple occasions here, warning them of the false teachings of the religious leaders, which are like leaven. Very small and innocent, but boy, it'll get in there and it'll spread. And that false doctrine will just spread among the people in the crowds and even them. Beware, you better beware of the leaven. They didn't understand it. They just caught the leaven and they, they formed their own thinking, which was wrong. And the Lord had to correct them. He, what is he doing? He's using hermeneutics here. All right, say, okay, all right, got a little bit of the leaven right there, but I'm not, I'm not perfectly convinced of that. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5. And you've got, to be able, you've got to be willing to work through the Bible. You can't be lazy. You can't just, well, I don't have to turn back and forth, I'm already done. No, no, you've got to be willing to study the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. Look at verse number 6. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now that's, everybody understands that. Just a teeny bit of yeast. <laughs> All right, put that in there and yeah, exactly. Well, you put way too much, whoa. All right, what we understand without it, it's unleavened bread. It's, it's that little wafer we partake. It's nah, not the greatest, it's not, it's, okay. Leaven, don't you know that a little leaven, just a teeny little bit of leaven, leaven with the whole lump, look at verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, notice negative connotation, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, you begin studying leaven a little bit, you go through the Old Testament, New Testament, you're going to see 95% of the time, it's always a picture of evil, wickedness, false doctrine, false truths. The only exception is one thing for the Jews with one certain offering, that was it. No, it doesn't say we, we understand this parable yet, but we, we are starting with that saying, well, normally, in, in, in the, that would be really confusing if sometimes it's, it's you, leaven's always good and sometimes it's always bad. And, sometimes, and so now when Jesus talks about the leaven, there'd be no way to know what he means. Unless, most of the time, if not always, leaven is used always in a negative connotation as just a teeny bit is all you need. It's false doctrine. It's false teaching. It's the old leaven. You better be careful. Well, then, if the scriptures is, then that, hmm, okay. And I begin looking at that a little bit. And then we go back to the parable in Luke 13. And we're going to hold your spot here and then turn to the companion passage. So go to Luke 13, 
Put your marker there or or whatever you want, a pen or pencil. And then let's go to the companion passage, which is Matthew. Matthew 13, easy to remember. Luke 13 and Matthew 13. All right, so, so again, we're trying to properly interpret. You say, well, Pastor, it's just one little random parable. Does it really mean much in, in the scope of things? Well, it does. It does because the average person would just skip right over it. You'd read it and say, huh. You, you might not even, even, let's be honest, you may not even worry about it. Be like, I just, I got my chapter done today. Or you would say, what does this mean? What is Jesus teaching? Or you can just read what someone else says and say, I'm going to go with that. And yet the Bible says that Christ said, you and I are to search the scriptures. Search. You can't be lazy. You can't be like, no, I don't just turn, I just listen. Well, that's, that's wrong. The Bible says don't be to hear the word. All right? But be doers. It says to study. All right? It says to be diligent. It says to add to your faith. I mean, we, so, so it, is, it is important how we interpret even a small little one-sentence parable because if that's how we approach that little one, what will you do with the big ones? What will you do with other things? Because usually our patterns develop how we do, right? That's why, you know, I, <laughs> well, you know someone said, all right, anybody ever had me for PE? All right, elementary, high school. I mean, hey, we're running laps and we're doing, I mean, we do not cut corners. All right. If that was that was a golden rule, right? You're you're running around the gym. You better run outside the border of the gym, the basketball boundaries. If you cut corner anyway, boy, it's oh come on, no no big deal. No, like when I was a kid, did I cut corners? Yes. All right. It's easy to do that, or you know, you get as close as you can, just jump over it. All right. Get that little ah yeah. But you, you, with the PE teachers not looking, or the coach isn't looking, well, you just go with what's easy. You cut the corners. Uh, yeah, and, and we'd penalize them. Why? Because if you cut corners in little things like that, you'll cut corners in anything. Right? The little foxes full of the vines. All right? If you'll just, if you'll just say, say, all right, you know, no one's looking. I just do the, oh, oh, then you'll do, that's your pattern of how you do things in life. That's, that comes out even in the dots. No parking there. That's ah, no big deal. I'll park right there. You, you probably cut corners when you're a pee. All right. Oh, I don't have to pay all the taxes. Oh, it's a, it, it'll, that little leaven, that little leaven phew, will spread into your way of thinking, your philosophy is a lot of things you do. All right. And here, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You say, well, is that really what this is? Christ using this parable in Luke 13. Is he saying positively that leaven is like the Bible or the gospel or the church and that we just need a little bit of it and no much, it's going to spread throughout the entire world and cover every corner of the globe, praise God. And by the way, that would be what we would hope would happen. Or is leaven portrayed as not a good thing, that it's wrong doctrine, and that just a little bit of wrong doctrine hid in the gospel or the church is going to spread throughout it and pervade every part of it so that there's total apostasy at the time when Christ returns. Well, there's a big difference in those two interpretations. So we come back to Luke 13, 18 and 19. What's the kingdom of God like, and whereunto shall I resemble it or compare it to? It's like a grain of mustard seed. Just a you know, mustard seed is very, very tiny, very little. It's almost insignificant, right? What's mustard good for? Just a condiment, <laughs> all right? He said it's like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took, and he just threw it in his garden. And it grew and waxed a great tree. Now, if you think about mustard seeds, you know mustard seeds don't turn into trees. Mustards, mustard, they're shrubs. They're little shrubs. They grow, they're nothing. So what's, so it's like, it's like a grain of mustard seed, small and insignificant, threw into his garden, and it grew, though, into a massive tree, and the fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. Again, no interpretation given. Well, does that mean then that the gospel and, and the birds, rep- you can read a lot of commentary on this, the birds represent the different denominations. All the fowls of the air, that's the, the, we've got the Presbyterians and the Lutherans, and we're all together, we're all unified, and we're all, the gospel, you know, it's just all, <laughs> is that what the Lord is teaching here? Because he uses the second one here to say it's the same thing, it's, this is very similar, it's like leaven, which a woman took and hid. Does the gospel need to be hid? 
Does God hide the gospel? Does it have to be hidden in three measures of meal? Meal is flour, that's grain, that comes from seed. Seed is usually always the Bible, the scriptures. So a little leaven is hidden in the gospel until the entire thing was leavened, until it was full of false doctrine and teaching. He said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what it's, what, you know, which one is the Lord saying? When you say, I, you might be here today saying, I'm not really sure. I've always believed it was this. I've always thought it was this. I've always been taught it was this. I've always read it was this. And that could be absolutely correct. But we need to make sure we know. How do we determine exactly? Can it be completely determined? Hmm, we're going to finish up. We've got about seven minutes. Five to seven. Go, you're in Matthew 13. This is the companion passage. This is known as the parable chapter. This is Matthew 13. This begins with, what does the chapter begin with? What famous parable? Just say it out loud. Parable of the sower and the seed, right? Very familiar, right? He gives that parable, and he also gives the interpretation of it, okay? He gives the interpretation of it down in verse 18. Hear therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth, look at verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, there's that phrase again, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. No, in the parable, what picked up the seed that was on the, the hard soil? Bird, fowls, birds. Who does Christ liken the bird of the fowl to here in 19? The wicked one, the devil. You can read the companion passages and other ones. The devil, he says it's the devil. So the devil comes, he says, the birds, that the bird that comes and catches away the seed, which is good, from that hard heart is the devil. He comes and gets it, verse 19. And they, oh, Wow. All right, and then he gives, the, he gives you the whole thing about that, all right? Okay, verse 23, he that receiveth seed onto the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. You know, even in this room right now today, there will be those who hear the Sunday school lesson and understand it and grow spiritually, and there'll be some here today who won't. Because it says... It's he that heareth and understandeth it, and then it brings forth fruit. So, so going back to that parable, 100% of the seed that was sown out, how much of it was good? Of the seed, the seed. What, what was the seed? The seed's the Bible. So how much of the seed was good? All of it, 100% of it. How much of it, though, bore fruit? There were, there were four types of ground. Only one, one-fourth, 25%. The seed went out. The seed is the word of God. It is pure. It is good. It went out. But only one-fourth, 25% of it, bore fruit that was lasting in any way. Okay. Hmm. All right. Think on that. Think on that. Then you come to the second parable, verse 24. The parable of what? The wheat and the tares. How many are familiar with that one? Parable of the wheat and the tares. Christ gives the exact interpretation of that in verse 37. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares, a tare is a weed that grows up that looks almost identical to wheat. You would not hardly ever be able to notice the difference. But they are different, but you wouldn't be able to tell. And so the parable was, a sower went out and sowed good seed, but then while he slept, the enemy came and sowed weeds, tares, so that one day, oh my goodness, in our good, they're all mixed together. Well, what do you want us to do, Master? Do you want us to go and rip up the tares? He said, no, leave it till the harvest. Leave them together, because if we pull up the tares, we'll pull up some of the wheat. Leave them together, and at harvest time, all will be made right. But even in that field, 50% good, 50% bad. Though this, interesting, all right? Now, we've got to wrap it up quick here, and between all those parables, look at verse 31. Another parable put he forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the l l birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Is Christ talking about one day there's going to be total apostasy before the days of Christ? Well, read the New Testament, right? What's it say in the last days are going to happen? What's going to happen with the unity? What's going to happen with the gospel? Verse 33, In another parable spake unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, 
till the whole was leavened. You could read more parables. Verse 47, the parable of the net. Threw the net in the sea, what he caught. Some was good and some was bad, 50%. You could read a lot of stuff. It says, verse 49, so shall be at the end of the world. Nowhere do I believe the Bible teaches that as it gets closer to the end times, that the gospel is going to permeate the entire world. Now, we would pray that it would, and that every corner is going to hear it and get it, and that the church is going to be purified. Absolutely not. I don't believe that. So what do I believe? I believe that the parables are referring to the negative connotation of false doctrine, which will pervade the church, if we could call it that, or Christendom, until there's total apostasy almost among, except for the true believers. All right? That's what I believe. Now, you know what? We can disagree as long as you would be able to give a valid biblical reason why you think otherwise, other than just reading what someone said. All right? Again, there's no interpretation given. We can agree to disagree, perhaps. I believe, though, biblically, if you compare that with the scriptures, I think that's what Christ is teaching. I think he shows the outward with the bird. I think that's the outward. And I think the leaven is the inward. All right? One's outward and visible. The other is that dangerous inward that just spreads. All right? To where that one world unity, one world, if you would, church religious movement is going to be. After all, what today? How many people in the name of Christ, the name of Christendom, the name of religion? Wow! All right? <clears throat> How much false doctrine is out there? Now, that's just an example of properly interpreting scripture. You can do your own studies. You can arrive at your own conclusion. Each one of us stands before the Lord. But I hope that, if nothing else... I challenge your thinking on how to approach some areas that maybe you say, hmm, many times the Bible gives right, the answers right there. Christ interprets it. The scripture clearly shows it. However, there are some times where it's a little more of a challenge, and we've got to make sure we're understanding the Bible correctly. After all, Jesus said, beware the leaven. And the disciples said, whoops, we didn't bring bread. All right, yes. I'd have to look. It's, it's in like Leviticus. You could probably look it up on East Sword. I didn't mark that one down. It says a one-time thing, I think, in Leviticus where at part of a... Every other time he said always unleavened, always unleavened. You think of the pattern, right? The unleavened is a picture of sin. When we eat the wafer, a picture of Christ's body, no sin. I think there is one time in Leviticus, I can look that up, uh, where it's, it's used in a positive note as far as with an offering. So 